Hello everybody, how are you doing today? Hope you're having a good day. This is another day, another opportunity we have to do something for God. So share this message, uh, put your own message on uh, Facebook and other social media platforms and and whenever you have the opportunity, mention God to somebody. Uh, so get out of your little comfort zone and, and uh, do a little things for God. And uh, uh, they all add up. They really do. All right. The title of the lesson today is called, Why Do Christians Have Problems? You know, sometimes we don't understand this because if everything is supposed to work out for our good, why do we still have problems? You know, Romans 8, 28 says, All things work out for good for those who love the Lord. And we read that and we think, Okay, everything needs to be a bed of roses. Everything's going to be fine without any problems. But then all of a sudden we see some of our brethren, they have problems. They have health problems. They have health issues. See, sometimes we all face rejection and defeats and failures. And we all... And this is just part of life, and we, we've all experienced it, and there's enough of the, these things happening to us that it can create negative feelings, and that can destroy us. So we've got to be careful. And some, sometimes the most painful wounds are not the scars that are outwardly seen, but the hidden wounds deep in the heart. Some people say something sometimes. Words do hurt sometimes. If people say something, it really hurts our feelings. And those are deep wounds that we have to contend with. And so some of these could be the most dangerous type of wounds. I mean, setbacks in our lives can take the joy out of living. I mean, our faith could be weakened. And if we collect enough hurts, it will stop us from wanting to press forward. So that's why we have to keep working on this and praying about this. So don't let the hurts hurt you. See Matthew 13, 19 through 22, Jesus explains the parable of the soils, or what we sometimes call the parable of the sower. And to his, he, he was explaining it to his disciples, explaining what they all meant. And these soil conditions explain in detail why we have problems. Some of, sometimes because we have our own problems, we have the hardness of heart. Sometimes we, we just don't have a deep root foundation. And sometimes we get choked out by the things of this world. But, but occasionally we'll run across someone with a good heart and good soil. And they will produce and make other Christians. That's where God wants us to be, to make other Christians. Um, just getting by trying to get by, that's really not going to cut it. See, the problem of falling away is not new to Christianity. In fact, it's an age-old problem. And sadly, many who started with Christ have left him. We call it backsliding or returning to the world. And often leading the way are life's problems. Life's problems are the cause of all of this. And often... We have this problem because Satan uses these problems to keep us from doing what God would have us to do. We just have to remember that's where it call, comes from. See, every good thing comes from God, but everything bad comes from Satan. So we just have to learn that and remember where, to, where the good things are. And so God never promised us that we would be problem free in this life. And that's true. Some people think and some people misinterpret Romans 8, 28 to teach that very thing. No, that's not the case. Now, when we have problems and trials, they come in three different ways. First of all, we cause our own problems. In 2 Timothy 4, 10, it says, Make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas hath deserted me, or Demas hath forsaken me because he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. And, and so, in here we find a fellow who, in 1 Timothy, he was uh, uh, commended for being a faithful servant, and then 2 Timothy, all of a sudden, uh, he's turned back into this world. And, and so, uh, he, he, he brought it on himself. Sometimes people cause problems. You know, James 1.12, Blessed is a man who endures trials because when he has passed the test, 
he will receive the crown of life that he has promised to those who love him. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we, we put through trials and tribulations and we're supposed to consider them with all joy because what it does, it produces the endurance that we need. And then problems come because of circumstances. Some things that cannot be helped, some things uh, they're, they're kind of spurred on by other things as well. See, in Acts 19, there was a riot in Ephesus that threatened Paul's life. But God saw to it that he was protected and he was safe. So people react to problems in different ways. Now, for us, how do we handle these problems that we're faced with? Well, well, there's four ways in which what, how we do it. We cover it up. You know, 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Sometimes we shut up. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But sometimes we don't do that. We give up. You know, Philippians 3.11, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. And then we have to learn to overcome. I mean, there, there's what we can do. We can either cover up, shut up, or give up. But what we really need to do is overcome. Now, in Revelation, we see in the chapters 2 and 3, several times the churches are told, he who overcomes uh, is going to have the victory. And so the victory over problems is achieved in three ways. First of all, like based on what we just said, instead of covering up, we need to grow up. That's kind of a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. They don't like being told you need to grow up. I mean, sometimes we tell that to our kids and when we're trying to get them to act responsibly, and trying to tell grown-ups you need to grow up, that's almost a slap in the face, and that's how they're going to take it. But in Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And then instead of shutting up, we need to speak up. You know, Galatians 6, 2, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Sometimes, yeah, we need actions speak louder than words a lot of times. And so, yes, we need to speak up whether we use our voice or whether we are doing some action. We need to speak up. And instead of giving up, stand up. You know, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 is, I, I think, so so valuable for the Christian. It, it's, it's loads of encouragement for me, and I hope it is for you, too. Paul writes, therefore, we do not give up, even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I mean, just thinking about that and learning that and, and focusing on that, that means everything we're having to deal with, it's going to be worth it if we can remain strong and faithful. Because what this life has to offer, all the problems that we have, are really just temporary. See, a preacher by the name of Stan Toller, he said, many of life's failures occur when we are close to success. Well, I know that that happens. Sometimes failures occur after you've had success. And, of course, many times in between. You know, what did they say about Thomas Edison? F tried about a thousand different things before he found the, the tungsten filament for a light bulb. And how did he figure that out? Well, he, he had a thousand failures, but each one told him how not to make a light bulb. Then he finally learned. So, sometimes failures happen even after we've had success so you remember when the space shuttle blew up during that liftoff years ago see after a very long investigation they determined that a small piece of rubber a little o-ring failed and this one little tiny little problem led to other problems for which the shuttle was not designed to handle 
So it's a little thing sometimes gets in the way and causes big problems. We, we know that in our vehicles, in our cars and trucks, a little bitty circuit, I mean, so smaller than a dime even, can, can go out and, and, and leave you hanging there. So anyway, now, in 2 Kings 6, 8 through 23, we read a story where the king of Aram, or the, the king of Syria, is making war against Israel and surrounds Dothan, because he wants to capture the prophet Elisha. And Elisha's servant goes out and he sees this great army and he comes in and warns his master and, and he's all afraid. Oh no, there's so many of them. And Elisha said, do not be afraid for those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, please open his eyes and let him see. So the servant went back out. What did he see? He saw a massive host of fighters that must have been awesome to see. And their armor was nice and shiny and their shields were shiny. And guess what? They turned their shields just away and they blinded the Assyrian or the Syrian army. And what, what, what happened then? Well, instead of going in and killing them all, Elisha led them to Samaria. He fed them and sent them on their way. And because of his kindness, they determined we're never going back to fight against these people as long as we live. And they didn't do it uh, in their lifetime. So never close your eye to the of faith to all the help God has surrounded you with. And often we have been helped by God and not even realized it. This is what we call his providence. Sometimes we just give credit to God if something works out that's good. I mean, thank God for it. Whether he actually had anything to do with it or not, let's give him the credit anyway. See, in 1 John 4 and verse 4, it says, You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And in Romans 8, 31, If God be for us, who can be against us? We need to take that to heart, because God is for his faithful ones. He's there. And he, he warned about the fact, don't worry about the one who can take your life, but worry about the one who can take your soul away from God. And so, yes, we need to be aware of that and pay attention to that. We do need to fear God who is able to cast our soul into hell. So may we open our eyes of faith and see the resources God has made available to us. Well, there's several. I mean, one we can mention is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation is overtaking you except what is common to humanity or common to man. God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. I mean, there's a lot said there. I mean, just because we're Christians doesn't mean that temptations won't be coming our way. Yeah, they're going to be coming. Satan's going to be attacking us with all sorts of temptations. But you know what? God promises that we can handle whatever Satan sends our way. And God's also going to provide the way of escape, a way to get out of it. A lot of people, when they end up sinning, is because they chose to sin. Because God says they have the ability to not sin, but they chose to do it anyway. And so... But remember, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So yeah, things are supposed to work out, but sometimes we can question that. Yeah, and, and, and it's really difficult uh, sometimes to answer this when we see some of these things happen to our brethren. See, God has given us the tools we need to stand up. And that's true. In fact, God has given us everything we need to stand. You know, 2 Peter 1, 3, seeing that his divine power hath granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And then we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Then in 2 Peter 1, 4, 
uh, he, he continues, by these he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. So perhaps God is ready and willing to help in ways we've never dared to hope, never even thought of. And perhaps we have never had the faith to let God help us. See, there, there's another problem. You know, we're supposed to cast our care on him because he cares for us. 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. Seven. Yeah, and, and it's time to build up that faith. I mean, turn things over to God. Let God handle it. Do what you can for yourself, of course, but then turn the rest over to God. When you can't control the situation, I mean, it's time to ask God for help. So are you ready to get started? And like I say, another problem we have is that we fail to see the positive in things that most of the world considers negative. We do not understand why God would tell us that all things work for good when our loved ones and our fellow members get diseases like cancer or other diseases or have health issues. Uh, they go blind. Uh, they can't walk anymore and can't function like they used to. And why do good people die in auto accidents? We, we, we sometimes question that. There's so many wicked, evil people in this world that really they they have a death coming for them why didn't God take them instead well these are all just things that happen in life and we do not understand why good people suffer at the hands of evil people when God said he cares for them all you know we realize that maybe not in this country as much as other countries of this world but there there's good people suffering persecution all the time from evil people and, and you think, well, wait, isn't God watching out for them? The problem of this life reminds us that there is something better in store for us. And we've got to remember that. And that is where we need to place our focus. Our focus is not in this life. Our focus has to be on Jesus and the hope of eternal life, salvation in heaven with him. And so we are humans, and we will suffer the ills of all humanity. You know, as the Ecclesiastes writer said, time and chance happens to them all. I mean, it's going to happen. I mean, there's no control over what, where things happen and what things happen. And so we, we're going to suffer the ills of humanity. But what God means in Romans 8:28 is that our souls will be guarded and protected, and our hope will be secure. So do not fear the problems, but learn to appreciate them. You know, like James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you endure manifold temptations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect reward, your faith. The, the, the strengthening, the maturity of your faith. And so, when we suffer... We, we should recognize what this is. This is the way of life. When we suffer, we attribute it to Satan and say, and gives us an opportunity to ask God for help. And so when we do overcome, when we get through the trials and tribulations, we thank God for his assistance, but yet we also know that he's allowed us to overcome and that makes our faith stronger. And it will develop us to do greater service to God. So consider those thoughts. I mean, that, that's what we need to do. Uh, do something better for God. And don't focus as much on the problems as on the fact that we can overcome those problems. And things will be a lot better for us. All right, that's our lesson for today. Consider these thoughts. And Lord willing, be back again tomorrow with another lesson. Bye-bye for now.